for a fluoroscopy, uh, they had to be in a dark room because the fluorescent screen was very dim. So before they could do the procedure, they'd have to stay in the dark for 20 minutes. Well, if you wanted to take a break, you put on these goggles that kept your eyes dark adapted. So when you went back into the room, you just took them off and you were already in the dark. Over there is the California Academy of Sciences. Sadly, it's temporarily shut due to COVID, but it is one of many scientific and educational institutions filled with experts to help understand our past. And before we look to the future of healthcare this season, it's important to look back at the history of medicine. And for that, I'm talking remotely to Pamela Rose, who is a medical librarian working with the History of Medicine collection at the University of Buffalo, New York. Pamela, where is the first evidence that you can identify of human beings starting to treat each other? About 3000 BC, written evidence of herbal treatments. Um, then we fast forward to 420 BC. You're familiar with Hippocrates, I'm sure. The Hippocratic Oath. The Hippocratic Oath, the father of medicine. Um, Hippocrates is huge. Before Hippocrates, I mean, it, the Arabs, the Egyptians um, in China, all established very robust systems of medical care and based, again, on observation. And they certainly knew the human body had bones inside it. Uh, they knew there was a function in the circulation of the blood. And there was a particular uh, Dr. Harvey um, who documented all that and realized that the heart pumps a finite amount of blood around it. You don't manufacture it all every single day kind of thing. So, uh, so it goes a long way back. Cast your mind back through history, when was that moment that the human race designed the ability to look inside someone's body and, and what did that piece of equipment look like? I think you can go all the way back to Stone Age Man and the flint knife. I mean, flint has this wonderful property of being almost incredibly sharper than a scalpel that we can produce today. Uh, trepanning or trepanning is the process of poking a hole in the skull to let out the evil vapors. Trepanning is one of the oldest surgical procedures, and they were actually performing surgery um, centuries ago. So that would be a pivotal moment of using a tool. When you look at the advancements that have been made, the pr predictive nature of the way that technology is going, given your experience and all your knowledge of history, what springs to mind for you? Well, one of the mottos we have down in history is chart the future by exploring the past. So I think it's important to realize the mistakes that were made, the tools that were used, go on and invent what we need to invent and use the technology to its fullest, but realize that there are some things that have been discarded that we can now use to make our technology even better. Now, to dig a little deeper into the evolution of being able to image what's inside our own bodies, I then spoke to Professor Dan Bednarek, who creates the radiology collection at the Museum of Radiology in Buffalo, New York. What was the process, Dan, of doctors being able to see inside the human body to acquire and take an image? I mean, it didn't happen overnight. Well, it actually almost did. Uh, Rankin was uh, working in his lab, as were a lot of physicists at the time, looking at what were called cathode rays with Crookes tubes and things. And this was all the rage in physics labs. And he noticed they glow in the corner of the room and he didn't know what was causing it. And uh, he actually started investigating to see what was causing that glow. And it turned out he discovered x-rays. After doing about a month and a half of, of research, he published his work in December of uh, 1895 and uh, gave a talk in January uh, with a scientific audience and actually took another x-ray of one of the attendees' hands. And uh, after that, it went viral. But the real revolution really for you know current technology is the ability to see in 3D. And that came out in the 1970s uh, when we had Hounsfield uh, and Cormac uh, developing the uh, computed tomography machine. Okay, And that revolutionized things because now we could see soft tissue detail, not just really the bone standing out, and uh, we got into the computer age. That's really what started digital. Um, but of course, in the meantime, uh, MRI came out in, in about 1980s and magnetic resonance imaging, uh, again, revolutionized things because here was a non-ionizing radiation uh, or form of imaging that didn't use ionizing radiation, was not as ha hazardous 
and yet we can get much a more contrast resolution. You know, everything everything progresses. And I have to throw in ultrasound is in there too, because that's again non-ionizing. And that allows us to do obstetrical imaging without um, having the hazards of radiation. Like we used to do pelvimetry. Now with ultrasound, you can see uh, whether the uh, child is in the birth canal, is, is properly positioned, and all the things we used to do with x-rays can all be done with ultrasound with, with you know, very little risk to the, uh, to the mother or the child. What were the things that catalyzed AI to, to where we are today? I would say it started really with mammography, but now it's been expanded uh, with uh, deep learning into uh, looking for chest nodules uh, and uh, you know, other types of uh, radiographic imaging. Artificial intelligence can then predict for us which patients actually need treatment and which we can actually just let out of the hospital. Dan Bednarek, really good to talk today. Thanks for all those historical insights.